Well, hello, and welcome back to Brave New Teaching. We have a pretty cool interview for you today, friends, and Amanda is going to tell you all about it. Hi, Amanda. Well, hello, Marie, and hi, everyone who's here. Thank you for being with us for this 2022 season. We are rocking and rolling in season four of the podcast, which again is like so hard to believe. Bananas. Yes. You know, we just are so thankful that our community is growing and the people that we've gotten to connect with has just been just one of the best parts of hosting this podcast. And so as part of that, I was able to connect with a listener and teacher gram friend, Jolene Heineman. You guys might know her from Instagram. If you follow her and her counterpart, they are at choice voice teach and Jolene and Stephanie wrote a book a few years ago, and they wrote their book all about their choice reading program and how they implement it in their schools. Um, They go through a lot of the research-based practices behind it, which I know a lot of us have really been become well-versed in over the years. And we're all in to hear about their specific program. So I said, Jolene, you teach like 50 minutes from my house. Can I please come watch? And she said, "Uh, yeah. So I went down to her high school I spent the day there and I actually got to participate in this reader's workshop that she has put together and wrote about in her book. So what you're going to hear today is our interview that kind of came after I participated in two periods worth, two sections worth of the reader's workshop. It was so cool. I'm so jealous. I I will say one of the things, okay, hear me out when I say this, there are a few things that I miss from being a very early years teacher. I miss going regularly to observe other teachers. Like it was built into the fabric of like being a newer teacher, right? You have to go and watch other people. And then you just kind of get underwater, right? Like so fast, not that you're not underwater when you're first teaching, but it's one of the things that you have to do. So you go and do it. And observing other teachers is probably the single best thing for any teaching practice period. Oh, yeah. And so being able to go, like, I always think to myself, okay, let's do like we at my school a few times we've tried to do, we call like instructional rounds, right. Where you go and then we had it going and then like summer came and it's like, then we had it going and then something else happened and then COVID <laughs> happened. And now it's like, oh, you know, it'd be really great is to get back to that. And then we all just kind of look at each other and go someday. So it just sounds so cool though, to be able to hear you talk to at least another teacher, like talk to Jolene. I mean, I loved listening to it, just listening to how the two of you can just write in the moment, right after you've seen this in action, debrief and break it all down. It's just so good. Yes. Well, and one, of, one of the other things that you and I are trying to do here is not just sit on a pedestal and show everyone that we know what we're doing and he, listen to Amanda and Marie. Because <laughs> we know, might not. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely don't. And, um, and, and part of like the, the cool thing about the space that we have is the ability to invite others into it. And just having this chance to sit down with Jolene, like you said, like in the moment, like see the actual lesson start to finish. I was actually part of it. I was in the workshop, which you'll hear more about in the interview. That's so Um, cool. But like these strategies, like if we're not getting into the classrooms of our own schools and our own teacher friends, we're certainly not seeing nearly enough of other people's work around the world, around the country. And that to me is the opportunity that I'm trying to embrace in this like brief, like step outside of my own classroom. I'm trying to spend my time doing those things that I couldn't do. And that this is one of them. So I'm so excited that I was able to use a little bit of my side step in this career to bring this to everyone here at Brave New Teaching and listen and enjoy and meet Jolene. I did not get a chance to interview Stephanie. So please keep in mind, there is a brilliant duo behind this workshop method that they are going to go through or Jolene's going to go through. That was just like a timing thing. They're both amazing. They don't <laughs> teach at the same high school anymore. They used to when they were developing this and then Jolene moved on. This is just incredible. I think it's useful. You can start implementing these ideas in your classroom next week, next month. Um, Really simple. It's not reworking things we already know. It's just a new approach that I think you're all really going to like. Absolutely. And uh, we hope you enjoy. Let us know what you think in our Instagram comments and DMs and leave us a rating and review on iTunes if you have a sec. And uh, without any further ado, cue the music.
You're listening to Brave New Teaching, and we are so much more than a podcast. We give teachers the inspiration, support, and tools to challenge the status quo. I'm Amanda, and I'm a former English teacher from Illinois. And I'm Marie, and I'm a teacher from Southern California. Join us at bravenewteaching.com to find out more about our courses, festivals, and get every episode's show notes. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. We're going to get started right now. I am sitting here with Jolene, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell you a little bit about her experience teaching, where she comes from, and what what we're working on today. Um, Okay. Hi. (laughs) My name is Jolene Heineman. I teach at Oak Park River Forest High School um, right outside of Chicago. This is my 10th year teaching Prior to this year, I taught at Barrington High School for four years, um, and that is where I met my co-author and colleague and, and friend, Stephanie, yeah. who you know wrote the book with me. I'm from Wisconsin originally. I taught in CPS for a year. I taught in a high school at Wisconsin for a year. Um, and so, yeah. You've been everywhere. I've been everywhere. And what have you taught in all of this time? What have you been oh, teaching? I've taught junior American Lit 10 years now. Oh, <laughs> um, my For Lord. some reason, it's been constant all the way through, yeah. But... I've taught everything. I mean, I've taught freshman college prep, freshman honors, sophomore college prep, okay. sophomore honors, senior, like a survey class in Janesville. Juniors have been the consistency, I guess. And your favorite unit you've taught in those 10 years. <laughs> Can you narrow it down to one? And then we'll get into the, all the goodies. Ooh, uh, um, or or novel or like even, I know we're going to talk about choice reading. So choice reading yeah, well, aside. That's the big thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, aside that's from that's choice reading, is there like a favorite unit um, text that you... Oh my goodness. Um... I really love teaching narrative writing, okay. I mean, creative writing, um, kind of making the shift away from just personal narrative to being more just open fiction has been really important um, and kind of using, you know, short stories um, and, and choice reading as like the mentor text for their writing in a way that is, um, you know, they, they can do so much creative stuff and they have so many creative ideas if we if we give them the chance to do that. I think sometimes teachers are afraid of taking so much time to write a story, um, but that's the type of writing they're going to come across in the real world, that's what they're reading. You know, they're not reading literary analysis. And so it makes sense for them to be writing the type of text that they will be reading and are reading, in and, my opinion. <laughs> uh, you're 100%. And I think it would be fun for English teachers to get a little bit more, you know, I've been in the business world now for a little while. And the business world and marketing is storytelling. Yes, yes. Right? Exactly, like bu- exactly. building a brand, exactly. building a social media following. I mean, all of these things that a lot of our students are going to eventually go into, whether exactly. it's because they want to be a YouTube influencer or they're actually going to pursue marketing. Yes, yes. It's storytelling yes. and conceptualizing those yes. kinds of things. So, I mean, I think that's something really worth revisiting as an English department, aside from I'm going to go write a book. Like, yeah, no, yeah, but yeah. you could be writing yeah. the story of a brand or the story of, you know, Nike or whatever it well, might and be. And our kids are always selling them, like, not selling themselves. <laughs> they you know, like they are, they are. They're, they're selling their, their, you know, they're portraying themselves yes. in very specific ways online. And they, so they're telling a story, they're telling a narrative about, you know, their lives and they're presenting themselves in a specific way. And so I think that that all connects. A hundred percent. Okay. So let's, let's get into why we're here, which okay. is choice reading and specifically re- readers workshop. Um, we're going to talk about them a little bit separately. So I kind of want to give our listeners a chance to hear about your like making the case for choice reading. (laughs) They've heard from us a thousand times. You know, Marie is is huge in choice reading. Um, I'm not that I'm not, but she like took it to a whole new level in California, you know, just kind of share with us why you love it, like what it looks like in your room. Um, and even if like what your journey is, I mean, were you always on board? Right. So those kinds of things, let us know. I was not always on board. For me, the, the shift really came with um, when you realize that your kids aren't really reading the books. And, you know, you can give them, like, reading quizzes to try to, like, check that they're reading the books, but you, they can, you know, read that on Spark Notes. And plus, that's a meaningless skill, right? We're not in English class to memorize facts about a book. Um, and so when I, when I started thinking about, like, my actual intentions and goals for the class, they were not being met by using exclusively whole class books, you know, that kids weren't really reading or they were reading parts of or they were dipping in and out of. And so independent reading, um, you know, was a way to know that they're constantly reading, right? And like, I really like NCTE's term of like protected time, right? Having that protected time in class to be reading because we know, you know, even from our own lives that there's not a lot of time to be reading, right? Um, And especially for kids. um, And uh, 
you know, and, it's, and especially for kids who don't know that they like reading, right? And so having that, like, protected time in class where you see them reading, you know they're reading, and then at least they have that, you know? And if they're not reading the whole class books, then whatever. At least they're reading these other novels that, they, that they're that um, they working through throughout the year. And so uh, actually it was Stephanie uh, that got me into independent reading, you know, years ago now at, at Barrington. Um, we, we were both doing it. And actually a lot of teachers at Barrington do it. And then we were trying to think about how to make it have, have accountability. And I like what you said earlier when we were talking that accountability doesn't have to be, you know, a grade in the grade book, that it can be a, you know, it's just that it could be the community or it can be a, just the conference or just kind of having someone know what you're reading, you know, how far along in the book you are asking you what you like about it, like having that accountability aspect, adding that to our, our reading um, kind of led us to collaborative reader workshop, which we can talk more about. Yeah. So tell me really quick about the, your choice reading, like day to day. Are you doing kids are reading that protected time? Is that every day, every week? Um, and how are they getting books? Things like that. I mean, what does it logistically look like in yes. your classroom? So logistically, uh, we do 10 minutes a day. Um, I've tried other versions, like the 20 minutes on Tuesdays and like whatever. Um, for us, the 10 minutes a day works the best because it's consistent. You know, they're reading every single day. You know, if you're just doing it twice a week, then you don't know that they're reading every day, right? And I want them to be reading every day, to be building that habit. And if they have the consistency in the classroom, I found that they're more likely to bring the book home with them and keep reading it, right? Because they've been reading it every day. Um, so we do 10 minutes a day at the start of class. You know, you might think at first that 10 minutes isn't enough time, but it is. It definitely is. I mean, you can make a lot of progress in 10 minutes. So for me, I'm very fortunate to work in a school that has a very, I mean, a stellar YA collection of fiction, fiction collection. So our books come from the library. And then also I'm, I have my own classroom library that I've been building throughout the years. I had a book love foundation grant, uh, two years ago. So that helps a lot. I also just get books. I mean, wherever you get books, right? You might buy them. <laughs> yes. Um, also I have people, uh, donate them, parents donate them. That bag of books, um, I, I picked up when I was downstairs, uh, this morning. Uh, someone left for me. So, um, you know, kind of just building the library that way. So it co- comes from both places. My classroom library, I have organized by genre, which is more useful than how it normally is in a high school library where you just have fiction, nonfiction, right? I'll share uh, pictures. I took that's the first thing I did when I got here was take pictures of Jolene's library. Yeah. Um, and so that, I, that helps a lot for kids to find what they're actually interested in reading. At the start of every week on Mondays, I walk around and I just do this really old school. Like I just have like a spreadsheet clipboard um, and I walk around and I write down the page number that they're on. So that way I can see, again, it's not for a grade, but I can see, you know, are they making progress? Are they not making progress? Are they just like skipping around the book? Like, like the stuff that's going to point me to, to knowing that they're not actually reading, right? And that they might need a new book or maybe need to try something else. And so um, I do that every Monday um, and that. I mean, even just that little check-in and I can ask them how it's going and I can, you know, um, if they're flying through it, we can talk about that and be really excited. If they're not flying through it, we can talk about why that is. And so those little, like, it's not even exactly a conference, just that check-in is very useful. We also track our reading. Um, I have a, a bulletin board where I, once a kid finishes a book, print out the covers. Um, that's an idea that people were talking about on Instagram earlier this year. So and it looks so pretty. I'll take pictures of that yeah. too. And get that in, I'll put that in the post yeah. as well. Yeah. It's kind of, a, you know, an exciting way to like kind of remember what you read. And then also, I mean, I have had kids who look at it and like, oh, who in this class read, you know, yeah. that book? And um, yeah, somebody read book. The Odyssey. Somebody did read The Odyssey. He was I mean, reading it for all, all year. And I was like, that's such an interesting choice. But he was very committed. It was. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that just says so much about them, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so as, at any point, are you taking a grade for independent reading? Or is this just something that we practice, we do, and this is a part of who we are in this classroom? Or both? <laughs> yeah, I've gone back and forth. Two years ago, prior to going on, on the pandemic, I was making the shift toward having a, a grade for independent reading, just that you were making progress. So we did the whole, like, set a goal. So read for okay. 10 minutes, multiply that by six. That's your reading goal for an hour, right? And so making sure that you're you're getting an hour's worth of reading in outside of class. So okay. And I think that's what Penny Kittle and Kelly Gallagher talk about in Book Club. So I was doing that for a while. I don't think it's necessary at, at this point. I mean, I, you know, I kind of, I stopped doing it when we went virtual and I didn't really bring it back this year because they're reading. I know they're reading and it's easy to, I mean, it's easy to tell when they're not reading and then that's a conversation, right? And then if you, I mean, you know, in my three classes of juniors, I probably, I mean, I could name, you know, the three kids right now who haven't been reading this year, but that's a really small number compared to all the kids who are consistently reading, right? And so even if I were doing whole class books, you know, those three kids probably would not be reading the whole class books, you know, I mean, so because they're teenagers, 
Um, and if you were grading it, they probably still wouldn't be yeah, reading exactly, the books, right? Like exactly, that's, exactly, that doesn't yeah, make it yeah, a yeah. difference necessarily. Um, you know, I just kind of want to reward like, oh, easy, easy 10% of your grade. Just kind of have something in the grade book. I'm, this is a whole nother conversation, but I'm kind of shifting away from, I'm trying to change how I'm grading too. So if you talk about that in yes. your podcast, I would love to have that conversation we at some will. point. But so I don't do it. I don't put a grade in for the, like getting through the books. I do for reader workshop when we get into that, um, they do like, what we call one pagers based off of Kelly Gallagher's one pagers, um, but it's kind of shifted over the years. Uh, I do have them do some writing connected to their books and I do um, assess that. So there's, there are lots of ways. The reason I ask is I think that, you know, from the people I've talked to, there's this kind of anxiety around doing independent reading and feeling like it's so much record keeping. And there's so much that I have to get, uh, you know, documented and graded and other, otherwise, right. Kids won't do what they're told. And I think you've just, debunked that again, um, you know, that that's not, that's not how it has to work. And there are, there are things in our classroom that we can just do because we do them. And it's part of just like classroom management, right? How we, how we enter class, how we enter, you're not grading kids every time they talk to each other for participation. The same thing can be true, I think for with reading and it's, it's a behavior. This episode is brought to you by Curriculum Rehab by us, the team here at Brave New Teaching. It is the first and only teacher PD of its kind, a course to help teachers like you by guiding you through creating your own personal framework for curriculum. You make it work for you, your students, and your unique situation because nobody else knows what the kiddos in your classroom need the way that you do. Curriculum Rehab takes all of the resources available to you, all of the lessons, the assessments, the activities, all of the texts, everything that could possibly be there for you, and it helps you organize what you actually need in order to attain your teaching objectives. These are the strategies that Amanda and myself have used in our own classrooms, have developed over very long years of teaching and figuring things out combined together to create this framework and these strategies that we can guide you through. This course will give you the tools you need for a complete curriculum overhaul or to start from scratch. Wherever you are on that continuum, it does it all for you and with you on your timeline. So start today, do a little bit more in a couple of months, and then pick it up next summer. It's teacher PD the way it should be on your own time. Head to curriculumrehab.com slash course for more information, or just head to the show notes for this episode. We cannot wait to see you there. It's finally time to take control of what goes on in your own classroom and create the curriculum of your dreams. All right, let's get back into the show. Okay, so let's get into this idea of a reader's workshop, which is different from what the teacher's college, right, or middle school version of this looks like. Um, I know for me, so those of you guys who are listening, I am here like right now in Jolene's classroom and I just sat through two of these, well, two class periods, and I was able to be part of two different groups and I was blown away. I've, I've read Jolene's book and experiencing it was a lot like what it was like reading the book, but it was so, so cool. So let us, you know, kind of walk us through the process of a reader's workshop and how that integrates with your philosophy with choice reading. So we, we call it a collaborative reader workshop to kind of differentiate from, you know, other ideas of a reader workshop. And the idea is to kind of create a larger community around um, what students are reading. Um, So it's not just their teacher checking in on them, you know, it's, it's, it's a larger, it's a larger group. So what it looks like is once a month, we, you know, I normally do like first Fridays or something like that. This year I've been doing kind of the days right before long weekends, <laughs> um, which is a nice thing to do on those days, you know, it works out really well. So like, you know, we're here the day before Thanksgiving break, but uh, once a month we invite in people from around the school to like facilitate reader workshop. I have a librarian that I partner with who is consistent. And so I I get her first to make sure I have at least one other person. Um, And then we just invite other people, right? So um, today we had a retiree. She she comes in, a retired English teacher. Um, She comes in for two periods where we do it. We had a a special ed inclusion director. We had a science teacher. We've had other English teachers. Um, Last month, the principal came in. One of the deans likes to come in. Like she sought me out in the hall. She's like, I heard that you do this thing and I want to come do it because she wants to, you know, it's a way to connect to the kids without like there being a disciplinary issue or a grade hanging over their head. Like it's just a way to connect. So anyway, we invited all these people. Um, I always ask 
or Stephanie and I always ask for students like recs, you know, who do they want to see come in? And that's kind of a way of peer pressuring people to come in um, for the awesome. first time. And then once they, this is a side note, but once teachers do this once, they like always want to come back and they might, they might be annoyed about giving up, you know, a half hour of their day. And they, you know, of course, of course, we need all the time. Um, but it really is such a nice part of their day, you know, yeah. that they, that they want to come back and do it more consistently. So anyway, so each month has a focus because we're all reading different things. So we always have a skills focus. Um, you know, this year we've had three so far and we've been kind of reviewing just kind of basic literary plot points, right? So we did characterization, conflict, and theme were the three that I did this semester. And so if, if we're all reading different books, we can still talk about what a theme is, you know, and how that is different from a topic. And you can share out your theme. I can share out my theme. And like, we can share about different books, hear about different books. It's kind of a way of hearing about lots of different books that you might want to read, but still be practicing this skills focus, right? And it's a way of also connecting it to whatever you're doing in the whole class reading, right? Um, and so like second semester, we do book clubs around different American identities. We talk a lot about intersectionality. And so... I'll probably do a reader workshop where the focus is intersectionality, right? And so then they're connecting their choice reads to their whole class book as well. Yeah, so that kind of gives us focus, um, gives you a starting point for discussion. On discussion days, we start with 10 minutes of reading. As we're reading, we have facilitators join us. And then kids do a quick write just about the topic, right? Whatever the whatever the focus is, the skills focus is. So even if they did not prepare their one pager, which they should have prepared for uh -huh. today, um, they still have something to say because they all did the quick write. And so that gives us, you know, a starting point. So you don't have to feel bad if you didn't do your homework or um classwork in this case because they have time but you know mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and then uh, i always have facilitators introduce themselves and just what they're reading so it's just a whole bunch of book talks in a row and then we have about 15 20 minutes for discussion and uh, you know i always say start by introducing the book you're reading if it's new then share out your quick write because you all just did that so you all have something to say about that and then the conversation just kind of goes from there so focusing on theme uh, moving into other things i mean they often will go off into uh, you know things that might not be related to books at all and in our opinion that's totally fine because what we want to do is have kids like give students an opportunity to have positive connections in English class, to feel relaxed, to, to uh, feel like they're part of a larger community, to connect with their principal or their dean or their, you know, coach or, or who, whomever in a way that's like outside of authority almost. Like you're, you're talking more on a, on a one-to-one, -one, like, like you're reading a book, I'm reading a book and we're talking about that. It's not like anything's being held over your head. There are so many amazing points. I mean, I don't, I, I will probably ramble about this a lot in our conclusion, uh, when I'm recording by myself and I write down <laughs> all my thoughts, but I mean, number one, like the authentic audience, I feel like English teachers, we struggle with this a lot of times in writing and, um, even in discussion, but having an authentic audience for this conversation, talk about motivation, like forget grades. If we're going to kind of go back to that topic, if we want kids reading, giving them an authentic experience and audience to share their reading. This is what it was. And those points of connection, right? Not that, I mean, SEL, let's talk about SEL. Like this was, this was a social emotional experience just as much as it was a reading one. And that's human. Yeah. Like yeah. why, why do adults read? Well, I love to talk about the, the books of my mom and my brother and, and even not, all the time, but enough times that like, that's reading is communal. And I think that that was what's so amazing about, I've not really seen this in other choice reading efforts. And I think this is something that's not hard to implement. And clearly it's got the whole school, not the whole school, but you know, here and there you got, you're making these points of connection yeah. with adults. And have you guys run into any issues in terms of, I mean, just in general with either choice reading or readers workshop that you've had to troubleshoot around? Like, are there things that people might run into that you could say, caution, and yes. like, here's a possible solution? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, what are some of the roadblocks that came in the way? Well, the first roadblock is just getting people to come join, okay. right? And I, uh, you know, we started this at Barrington High School, and then I got the job here, and uh, I had to start totally fresh, and as a new teacher. And without like, your buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it was like, how do I convince people to give up, like, their precious, precious, precious prep or lunchtime to come talk to my students about books. So that's, that is a challenge at first. You know, we, I would say start with, you know, one or two, you know, people that you're consistent with, right? So partner of somebody who is part of their job potentially, right? So like a librarian or, um, co like we have a lot of teacher coaches here who have open periods specifically to come into classes, right? So start with one or two people that you know are consistent. And then if you just have 
three giant groups, like whatever, that's what it is. Right. But then, you know, I mean, obviously you can like peer pressure your friends to come in, um, but <laughs> rivalry. Have, I mean, Stephanie used to be, used to be really great because she bakes. I don't bake, but, um, so she used to bribe people with baking, but I'm not kidding when I say once people like know what you're doing, yeah. like word kind of spreads, they do want to come back. I, I, you know, that Dean did like approach me at the beginning of, of the school year. I mean, like, I heard about this thing that you do. And then, then other facilitators will recommend you to invite other people in like, Oh, I know this person likes to read and they don't, you know, they're not an English teacher. They don't talk about books that much, but you should invite them. Having kids invite people or having kids give you recommendations. Cause then you send them an email that says like, you know, someone from period three wants to see you, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then teachers are more very responsive to that. I have a science teacher that frequently comes in because of that, you know, because a kid invited him. So that's kind of a way of getting, of getting people in. Well, I think you've solved a lot of the problems. Like, cause I was wondering like, well, what's going to happen when you get into the group and then you have silent kids or kids are not talking. Yeah. You've already preempted that yeah. with the quick write and the assignment from the day before. So there's, yeah. and it's not, you've also preempted the time issue. 15 to 20 minutes is not too much time to fill, but enough time yeah. for good conversation. Exactly. So I think being able to manage both kids are coming prepared with something. Yes no matter what, because they were, they exist and they just quick, did a quick, right. Um, and that the time is not overreaching what's possible. I think those are probably the things that would make me the most nervous that you've solved. Yeah, Yeah. no, I agree. The other thing is like, if, if I've had parents come in, I've had community members come in. Um, and then also, you know, if worse comes to worse, you can always have a student run the group and then switch off, um, which is less fun, but Oh, Stephanie also has seniors come back into her, you know, so once like these juniors, I mean, it's been so inconsistent this, you know, these last couple of years just with uh, the pandemic, but, you know, I'll invite these juniors once they're seniors to come back and that gives them a leadership opportunity as well. So, yeah, I mean, the quick write is important. You know, the other kind of big obstacles are selling it, I guess, to your admin, selling it to other teachers potentially who might think that is too fluffy or, 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 uh, I mean, and that kind of comes into a, a larger pedagogical discussion, but yes. um, there, are way, there are definitely ways of making this work in any environment, right? So like we, uh, we started with a three week unit um, just at the end of the year and we kind of, we ran out of time and we, you know, we did been doing independent reading all throughout the school year. Um, and then we had three weeks left of the school year. We didn't know what to do. Um, and so we're like, all right, we're just going to, so we formulated this, right? So we met, you know, three Fridays in a row, right? So it was like a mini unit. And I've, and I've had, um, you know, people who have read the book reach out to me and say that that's kind of a, a good, what they've done, right? A good starting point. Because then you can see how it goes. You can experiment with it. Um, a three week long unit, four week long unit, whatever. And then um, that's kind of less scary than trying to commit to it throughout yes, the year. Yes, yes. You know, it also like works alongside whole class books. Um, if you are required to do a, you know, a series of whole class books in your, in your department. When we're reading a whole class book, like we just read there, there first semester, we still do independent reading on Mondays. So that, you know, checking in with kids, like, like yeah. seeing if they're, if they're reading outside of class, encouraging them to read outside of class. And then we can still do reader workshop because it's just a one day a week thing as opposed to, um, taking up a lot of time. So. Well, that's the thing is you've created flexibility, you've created yeah. accountability, and you've done all of that without robbing the joy of reading. Yes, correct. <laughs> that, so you deserve <laughs> all of the awards for that um, because that's really, I mean, that's really what it is. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it is a hard balance to strike, and I think it's one that I have given up on a lot of times. Um, I, I tried, I've tried lots of versions of this and settled into, you know, a comfort zone here, there, shifted, and I think that's what I love. And, and I'd love to talk more about the book. Um, I'm going to share more with everyone on the show notes about the book where they can get a copy of it. I will have a signed copy of it. So you can be <laughs> jealous of that. Um, but I, I kind of think, you know, this, this leads me into this idea of just teachers as professionals, teachers as the experienced pedagogical curricular and, you know, strategic experts in the classroom. What was it about this experience that led you to the creation of the book? I mean, where, how did we get from a three week panic unit to, (laughs) to a book? How did we go there, Jolene? (laughs) Well, it started uh, really because we, uh, I mean, we're very, we were very excited about the idea, you know, because yeah. once we did our three week panic unit, then the next year is when we turned it into, um, you know, the once a month reader workshop. And so then we, we were doing that and that was so great. And it was, uh, we were seeing such great results. Um, and so we wanted to present at NCTE. Um, and so we, we did present at NCT. <laughs> um, and then for us, what happened is, um, a representative from Roman and Littlefield just reached out to us and said, like, we've been looking for a, 
book on reader workshop or, or on choice reading. And, and, you know, I, I saw your presentation or, or, you know, she, I mean, she saw us in the uh, program and then came to our presentation and then, you know, once, you know, then she invited us to write the book. Um, and so that's really how we got the opportunity. And what was it like? I mean, how, I mean, you can, I don't know how much you're allowed to share there. Give us all the spoilers. I mean, what, I mean, you're teaching full time. Yes. You're a full time human. Yes. Um, <laughs> And now you're writing a book, which is, yeah. I think for a lot of us listening, like I'm, I'm going to talk for myself, like very intimidating. The idea of like, talk about authentic audience, like the idea of people reading. Like yeah. I, I don't think about it on the podcast. Cause right now I'm just talking to you. Yeah. I don't think about the people who are listening. I mean, I do think about you people who are listening, <laughs> but it doesn't feel the same as I think like the permanence yeah. of yeah. putting your writing out into the world. I mean, yeah. what was that like? Um, I mean, it was stressful. <laughs> okay. um, it was a, well, I mean, Stephanie was also having a baby at the time. Oh she was, my she was word! Pregnant. She, so she was, life she was pregnant, world. and then and then she gave birth, and so she had an infant, um, and so that was all the way writing the book as well. Um, and we were both in grad school at the time too, um, and so it was it was a lot. It was kind of just you know you have to you have to you have to do it. Um, so I guess for us, it was a lot of like reading model text, honestly, which is something we talk to kids about, um, and it's a real thing you do in the world, right? I mean, reading you know reading and rereading you know Penny Kittle and Kelly Gallagher and Kylie Mears, and, and kind of seeing like what the structure of those books look like um, and uh, you know what would be what's useful and what's not useful I guess um, and so trying to figure out how to make it you know because a lot of you don't want it to be theoretical too theoretical you know you want it to be concrete you want it to be practical you want it to be something that someone can you know buy the book and then you know the next semester or the next week like be able to use it right um, and so that was one of our goals is trying to be very practical something that happened is that we were writing in first person and our publisher at one point like pretty late in the game you know we kind of they had said not to do that we kind of were like all right whatever like they'll they'll hold on that they did not so um, but then what we ended up doing is we just changed it to second person we made it more like a manual but that was a that was a, a challenge because we had the book written and it was it was mostly in first person um and so we have like our forward and our and our uh epilogue i mm -hmm. guess you know yeah. which is kind of more narrative first person and the rest of it is more like a manual like you you should try this um okay i mean i guess for me uh, the big part was figuring out the organization because okay. because once you got the organization figured out you can kind of feel, so it's out, outlining before because <laughs> we were like getting our ideas down and trying to figure out what we wanted to talk about um and then when when i remember like sitting i can tell you like sitting in in a specific coffee shop in chicago and kind of playing around with the organization and then figured out like if we separated like with the what at the beginning with like what actually is this like what does the reading look like what does the writing look like what does the um the discussion look like and then our second half of it was um why and that way like if you're somebody who doesn't have to be sold on choice reading at this point, like here, here's just what it is. Here's what you do. Right. Yeah. But if you're somebody that do, does need to be sold, you know, we have, um, you know, these are kind of the, the way that we broke it up was how it helps academic achievement, how it helps uh, SEL equity. So both differentiation and, and cultural responsiveness. Um, and then also how it helps your like lifelong reading habits, like what adults do, um, as you said before. Um, and so we broke it up that way. And kind of once we got that sequence figured out, um, then it was just, I mean, we know all the stuff, you know, it's just a matter of putting it down in a way that felt practical for like, what, what would be the book that we'd want to read? You know, would you do it again? Write a book? Yep. Oh, um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I would. Yeah, for sure. I, I would like to, um, you know, Stephanie and I have gone back and forth between like, no, never again. Um, and like, of course we're going to do it like next year. Um, but no, I mean, it was hard and it was, you know, it was also like, I got the new job and so we were seeing each other every day. And so it was difficult to find time to collaborate. And so that made it more difficult to, but yeah, I mean, I think now that I know the process, um, and also like trust myself more, I guess. I would definitely write another book. Yeah. So what, what does your future look like? I'm going to ask Steph this question too, but what do the next 10 years look like for you? I mean, are you going to keep going down like the publishing path? Are you going to, what, what are you going to blow up next? <laughs> well, like I said, I wanted to start doing something with grading. Um, yes. Uh, I'm reading pointless right now. Yes. I say, yes, okay. I'm like, yeah, really into yep. that. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm happy. I'm happy at Oak Park. Um, you know, I moved, like, like I said at the start, I moved around to a lot of different schools. And now this, I think, is my, well, I know, is my, is my landing place. Um, I don't anticipate leaving. Um, I'm very happy with the community and, and the school. Um, and so I intend to stay in the classroom. Um, you know, I think that it is a dream to be able to teach and also do something else, right? And so, like, 
I, I mean, I would love to do a consulting. I would love to do um, coaching, teacher coaching. Thanks again for listening to Brave New Teaching. We'd love to keep the conversation going over on Instagram. And while you're there, check out the links in our bio for the most up-to-date events going on in the Brave New Teaching community. Thanks for being here and have a great week at school.